Hello everyone, welcome to Purpose YouTube. My name is Dusty Small and I'm the lead pastor here at Purpose Church. As many of you know, Purpose Church is a brand new church located right in the heart of Bossier City, Louisiana. We're so glad you're here to watch today's message. Before we get started, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know your name and where you're watching from. Let me know what you're believing God for right now in your life and how I can pray for you. And one last thing, as God begins to speak to you through this message, would you comment there in the chat section? Let us know what God's speaking to you about. I love to go back and see how God's moving in your life. We hope today's message will encourage you and your family. So we've, 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 carried, we've talked about a variety of, of areas that need to be shattered in our life. And this morning, we're going to talk about not knowing why. How many of you have ever been in a place, come on, where you just maybe, well, let me say it like this. Have you ever felt like God maybe got it wrong? Have you ever looked out and about and said, man, it just don't seem like God's getting it right right now. I see a lot of stuff happening, and I'm just not so sure that everything is happening the way that it would if I was on the throne. You ever been in a situation where it didn't quite play out like you wanted it to play out? Yeah? You ever, you ever been in a, a, a place where you're just like, why, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why? We can all be there. Our theme verse for this morning is, is in Deuteronomy 29, 29. Now, I'm going to preach from Psalm 73, but I'm going to set it up for us because there's something that Moses shares with us that I think really begins to set the stage for what we're going to see in the life of, life of Asaph as he reads a, or writes a psalm to us. So Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. Say that. Secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them. Can I just tell you that's good news? You're not accountable for the things you don't know. You don't know it all, and God says that's okay. You hear me now. But watch this. He says we're not accountable for them, but... We and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. Now, I've heard a lot of preachers say this over the years. I've said this. I would personally just do good if I could just put into practice everything that I already know. You know what I'm saying? I want to know more, but man, how good I would be if I could just do everything that I already know to do. Right? And so that's what Moses is saying right now. You're only accountable for what you know. Understand, God knows it all. You don't. He has secrets that you don't know, and you're not accountable for those things. That doesn't stop us from asking why. That doesn't stop us from pondering things that seem to just be out there, and I wish we could figure it out. Doesn't, doesn't remove the human nature that asks those questions why. Let me, let me set up a little bit, did you know, Bible fact here. Did you know that Moses, uh, they, he and the Israelites had been in the wilderness for 40 years when we read Deuteronomy 29, 29. Now, this, this guy has seen just some extraordinary miracles. He's seen the exodus from Egypt. He stood at the Red Sea, and he's held his staff out. And guess what? The sea split. Like, he's seen some extraordinary things when he wrote the secret thing. There's belong to God, basically. We're not, we don't know everything. Did you know that Pharaoh had put in place for a mass genocide of young boys when Moses was a little baby? And he literally escaped this mass genocide just like Jesus did because his mother put him in a basket and sent him down the Nile River. And guess who found him? The princess of the palace. Did you know that Moses actually grew up in a palace? He grew up as one of Pharaoh's kids, if you will. So when he goes back after God speaks to him to say, let my people go, he was speaking to the man that really raised him in a sense. He grew up in his home and he has a very strong word from Pharaoh. Did you know that Moses wrote the first five books in the Bible? Did you know they're called the Pentateuch or the Torah or the law? Right? What are they? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses wrote those. But that sets us up for the title that I've, I've given this message today, Not Knowing Why. Will you say that with me? Not Knowing Why. It's a million-dollar question, but why? We've all seen something happen. We've all had something happen to us, and we've been there. And Moses is in a place where he's seen God do some extraordinary things, but he still understands that no one has total knowledge of God. I just bet you that Moses would have been like, God, why did we have to wander for 40 years? 
Why did you take us out and not take us in? He knew the area. He knew it didn't take 40 years to get to the promised land. Why did they have to wander? Was there no other way to deal with this? than the way that he dealt with it. I can just imagine there were several things that Moses went through. But God's ways are not our ways. We don't always understand everything that God does. In fact, Isaiah said it like this. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So I pray, Lord, help me to have thoughts like yours. Help my ways to be like yours. Help me not to just be down here so low that I don't come up to your ways. Lord, let me recognize today, right, that my ways are below yours. But, Lord, help me to get up to the place that you want me to be. Any bowlers in here? Anybody love to bowl or just bowl with sometimes recreation? Maybe you, maybe you don't love it, but you just you do. You go bowl. You've been, anybody been bowling? Anybody heard of bowling? Trying to get everybody to raise a hand in here. I mean, like, I'm looking for 100% participation here, right? Well, uh, you know, one of the most amazing bowling stories ever, I don't know if you've heard this, but on January the 18th, 2010, in Plano, Texas, anybody know where Plano, Texas is? You heard of, anybody heard of Texas? <laughs> Come on, work with me this morning, church. Well, amateur bowler uh, Bill Fong, he was trying to bowl not just a perfect game, but a perfect series. Now, let me give you a little bowling tutorial on some of this or just some facts. So a perfect game would be 12 strikes, which is a 300. So some of you that have bowled, anybody ever bowled over 100 in here? Anybody ever bowl over 200? Any 200 bowlers in here? Nobody. We had a couple in the first service that had bowled over 200, right? So if you've not bowled over 200, obviously no perfect gamers in here, right? But so there's, there, this, is the, this is the big thing for a bowler is to bowl a perfect game, 12 strikes, and uh, then, then you can bowl a series of games, which is three, and the, the perfect series is to bowl a 900. Can you imagine back-to-back-to-back to back to back 300 games? Uh, Up-to-date, Google tells us that there's only ever been 39 perfect series ever in the history of bowling. Wow, 39, only 39 people have ever bowled a perfect series. And on January the 18th, Bill Fong is on the verge of bowling not just a perfect game, not back-to-back -back perfect games, but he is right there to bowl a perfect series. He has bowled 33. Just step into his story. On, on the 33rd frame, on the 33rd roll, he is back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. 33 times he's had strikes. When he approaches the lane for his 34th one, he started to sense something. He felt like something was coming over him. You know, like in the moment, like you can just feel some tension you know what I'm saying? Like you can tell this is getting really serious. Now, he had, been re he had been enjoying the moment. Now, when you get locked into something, they say don't make changes. Uh, when you're just in, you just stick with it. Uh, he had changed balls. He, like he was just laughing, having a really good time. He had done this. Baseball players, when they get locked into something, they, they're like, they don't step over. The, they won't even touch the, the, the chalk line in sports. They, uh, like I've, I've heard some of these guys that get so superstitious, like if they were letting their beard grow out and they get up there and they strike out the first time about, they'll go in and shave it. Like it's just like this so intense. They got their bat. Like everything, like you can get that way. Well, same with bowlers. You can get locked into the game. But he's been really just living it up, enjoying the moment. Well, the crowds around him, everything is getting quiet. People start to realize this guy is on the verge of history. So there's about 100 people. Nobody else is bowling. Everybody has gathered around. And on his 34th frame, he lets it go. It looks good like every other one. I mean, every other one, it's just like boom, boom, and it's pop. You hear the pins. They just all fall. But on the 34th frame, the nine pin. The nine pin stands up and it's wobbling and everybody like deep sighs. But then out of nowhere, it's like just the Lord seemed to, to hit another pin and it's slowly rolling across the lane and bam, knocks the nine pin down. He's got 34 in a row, but all of a sudden now he's sweating. He's not been sweating the whole time. He's starting to get dizzy. He goes back to the, to the ball exchange. He gets another ball, steps up for 35, boom, knocks it down. Pins go flying and here he is ready to take and make number 36. And as he gets up, I mean, it's perfectly quiet. Everybody's watching. He lets the ball go. It looks as good as it's always looked, but the 10 pin. This time it was the 10 pin. And there's no slow rolling pin. People fall to their knees. Their videos are shaking because their cell phones are out. People are gasping. And Bill just drops his head, walks back, 
and he sits down. Everybody's wondering, how could this possibly happen? How could you be this close to 36 strikes and miss it by one pin? Perfect game, 900. He's got an 899. But here's where it gets really interesting. See, after the evening was over, Bill heads home. He's still dealing with dizziness that he was on the 34th frame. He just decides he's going to go to bed. Later, he realizes that he suffered a stroke that evening. He ended up having to have open heart surgery. And when the doctors are looking at his heart, they come out. He's you know, t- talking about the incident that happened that night. And the doctors say this. Doctors told him that the only thing that saved his life that night was that the 10 pins stayed up. They said, had that last pin fallen, your blood pressure would have likely raised extremely high from all of the adrenaline, all of the excitement. And it's very possible that because your blood pressure, because the adrenaline, because of your excitement, it likely could have killed you. And so what he thought was the worst thing that ever happened to him ended up being the best thing that ever happened to him. Can I just tell you, we don't always know why. I mean, sure, this is a different story, and there are some really tough things that have happened to you that might not fit right into this little story, but we don't always know why. And I'm going to read Psalm 73 to you. We're going to look at the first 16 verses, and I think it's such a relatable psalm. And I hope you'll step into his story. And I bet you as you start to hear some of this, you're going to recognize that, man, I've been here too. I've been in a place just like this guy. So turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 73. This is a psalm of Asaph, somebody that worked very closely with David. Give me an amen when you get there. Going to need at least two more before I get going. All right, truly, God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jewel necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while the riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why. I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. What a difficult task it is. I tried to make sense of it. I tried to understand it. Come on, anybody ever been there where you just looked around and you had some questions about life? You looked around and you're like, why this and why that? Did I really, did I waste my time? Why did I do all these things and then it didn't play out like I thought it was going to play out? You've been there. You, you can connect with Asaph. What, I, what I've learned is I've, I've, I've read my Bible and I've, and I've got into the stories of the men and women that, that are just made it into the pages of scriptures. I've come to realize that great faith will always wrestle with some doubt. You're going to wrestle with it. You're going to have some things that become a battle that you can't overcome. But all of the greats, we start to see at some point, question some things. They, didn't, they couldn't make sense of everything. But I know that honest doubting is actually a sign of faith. Now, I'm not saying I just doubt everything. But I think that honest doubting, right? I don't, because I don't doubt things I don't believe in. I'm trying, I'm honestly trying to figure this thing out. And that's what Asaph is doing. Asaph says, I looked around. I've got faith. He starts out saying, truly, the God of Israel is good. Like, I know that he's good, but what is going on when I look out and about and I see these fat cats getting everything? I'm over here trying to live my whole life for God, and why does it seem like every morning I wake up and i got more something else to deal with? Come on. It's, he's not without faith, but, he, but he's talking about, like, I know God is good. I haven't lost my faith, but man, when I start looking around at everything, there's some times I wonder if God's got it right. Where is God? We start questioning all these things. I mean, it's like I looked around and saw. Some of you, it might have sounded something like this. I started scrolling last night, and 
Ooh, boy, was I fired up. I started wondering, right? So-and-so posted about their presidential candidate, and they would just, oh, they, you know the got you moments, like the got you post? Like I, they, it's a post, somebody, and they, oh, I got you now. Right, it's, it's the little aha moments, right? And then, so you're triggered, you know, and you got to get them back because you got to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. But, you, but I'm going to speak my truth. i got to stand up for my guy or my girl or whatever it is. We do it, right? We looked around. We started scrolling, and we get drawn into this. And then, and then the way that it happens, especially when we start scrolling, it sounds a little something like this. People that I think I'm better than are doing better than me. And then you're not going to go out there and broadcast that. But, I mean, in your, in your own mind, you think you're at least equal with them, if not better. And why is it that they're doing better than you are when you really think you're better than them? Come on, let's get real this morning, right? We can get real and talk about it. And, and then I think Asaph is saying, you know, his sacrifice wasn't getting him ahead. He was sticking to it. And then he comes to a place where he says, what am I doing all this for? Why did I, why did I keep myself pure for? Why? Why am I committing to all these things and these fat cats? I like that part. I don't know. That, I don't know. I just love that, the fat cats. It also could look like this. You feel like you're missing out on something. And that's, 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 that's the way the enemy loves to get in there and work, right? Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Right? How did, Eden, how did, how did Satan work in Eve's life? He, he takes her eyes off all that she has and puts it on the one thing that she doesn't have. Oh, would God really keep something from you? And, and that's how it happens when I start scrolling, and I'm like, oh, God's keeping me from that. Oh, look how committed I am. Oh, look how faithful I am. Look, look at all the things that I've given up for you, God, and, and, and I'm not appreciated. I'm not seen. I'm overlooked. And the people that are out there doing things that are contrary to what we know in the Word, they just seem to be blessed and highly favored. And so others get to do it. Others get to go there. Why can't I? And then what happens is we start this, this downward spiral, and we, we ask, like it said in verse 11, and we say, does God even know what's going on? And we question, is he getting it right? But here's where it really starts to get personal. So what I would encourage you to do in this next portion of the message is to get real with yourself, okay? Because we're going to see... We're going to have an opportunity to get really, really real with ourselves. Asaph realized he's the one that had jealousy and envy in his heart. As he started to spiral out of control, as he started, he said, how did he say it? He was like this, as for me, I almost lost my footing. I almost stumbled. He said, my feet were actually slipping and I was almost gone. Come on, I bet this morning as you're talking to yourself, there's, times, there's been times in your walk where you felt like you almost lost your footing, like your feet were slipping and you were almost gone. You can look back to a time in your life where something happened and you begin to question it in such a way. And, and, but Asaph's saying, you know what, I realized it was in me. It wasn't them. It wasn't they. But it was in me. And he says in verse 3, watch this, I envied them. Oh, my goodness. He's like, I, I, I got envy in my heart. I got jealousy and envy in my heart towards these people. And how does that work? Well, I'll tell you how it works. Because he became discontent with what God was doing in him. And so he's unsatisfied. And it's always when you start to compare yourself to others that you become discontent in your own life. Chantal, she was preaching to me the other day uh, when we were in our room. And she just took me through a whole crash course on some of this stuff. And she started telling me, she goes, you know, Dusty, when it, when it comes to comparing and the psychology of competition and the psychology of our insecurities, she began to talk to me. She says, you know, this, this comparing thing that we do, we never compare ourselves one-to-one. -one. Meaning, I look at your whole life and evaluate it, and I look at my whole life. We'll put all the good things over here, all the bad things over there, and we'll compare us one-to-one. -one. You don't do that. What you do, though, is you start taking the highlights from about five people that you think you're better than or you think you're equal with or however that plays out, right? But you take all of their highlights and then you compare it to your life. You don't look at the things they may be struggling with. You don't look at their shortcomings. You just see that one thing they're really good at. And then you compare it to yourself and then you start to look around and say, oh, but man, I just don't measure up. Oh, man, I just not, might not be as good as others. And then she, she was taking me through this, and she goes, you know something else that we do? She said, social media 
has put us in circles that we normally wouldn't walk in. Let me explain. So you have a group of people that are around you. You have your peers. And, and, and we know that birds of a feather, well, they, they flock together, right? That we call them peas in a pod sometimes. But we also say things, hey, show me the closest five people to you, right? And I can tell you what your life is like. We also say things like, you know, hey, you don't always want to be the smartest person in the room. You're tracking with me, right? But, but we seem to gravitate toward people that are like us and that are generally about on the same level as us. You, you're tracking with me, right? Social media has allowed us to walk into circles that I normally wouldn't walk in day to day, right? People that have really crafted a certain skill or people that have really worked hard to achieve a certain educational level. But it's like I can be right up in their living room. I can be right up in their life and feel like I'm a part of their life. And then I can take someone who has worked so hard on their education and they've mastered it and they got that little DR in front of their name, right? And then, but it's, then I, I feel so insecure because they're so much better than I am. You just don't realize they, they've worked to get to the place that they are, and I'm comparing my moment right now to all of their hard work that's their backstory, and God's going to take you places. You just have to continue to put the work in to get where God's going to take you. And, and, but what happens, though, we start to get jealous and envious of people who are in places that I'm not at yet. And I'm comparing myself to people, and I, and I forget all the things that God is doing in my life. I mean, we say it like this, like, we'll sit there and let our ice cream melt while we're counting the sprinkles on somebody else's. <laughs> Literally, I take the kids to Andy's to get ice cream, and they're going to see who got the most cookie dough in there, right? Oh, yours is a little bit higher. Oh, they put yours in a bigger cup. You see what I'm saying? Like, and it's a disaster. Like, never mind you've got more than enough in your cup. Right. It's just literally, Right? I'm going to straight throw one of my kids under the bus, and they're not in here, and I won't say whether, what their name is, but I'll tell you that he was in my office a minute ago, <laughs> and I saved a little bit of my chocolate-covered twist from this morning, which he had one. I, gave, I bought him one special. I go buy the donuts, and then I buy myself some separate, and I put them in there for my, my office, right? I, I buy myself two. He gets one, okay? But I'm twice his size. That's my excuse. Anyways, if you can hear me... <laughs> He's like, oh, man, that's not fair. You got another one. I'm like, what are you talking about? I, I got you one. Like, it's just he's not focused on what he got. He just focused on what he doesn't have. God forbid I got two and you got one. <laughs> and I saw him sneak out there and get another one in between services. <laughs> All right. Don't tell him I said anything about the donuts. I, I envied them, he said. Watch this. When you're dealing with the emotions of disappointment, pain will lie to you. When you're dealing with the emotions of disappointment, your pain in the moment will lie to you and make you think you're not being treated fairly. It'll make you think that people don't understand you. It'll make you think that God is not interested in your circumstances. And then you will lose your footing. You will start to stumble. You will start to shift. And like, like Asaph is saying, man, I, just, I was almost gone. I, was almost, I almost walked away from this thing. I know God is good, but I almost walked away from this because I let jealousy and envy get in my heart. And so I start to think something's wrong with me. God doesn't care. They don't appreciate me, and they don't see me. Something's wrong. I'm over here working my butt off, and somebody else got the promotion. Come on, you with me this morning. And then there's this cocktail of doubt and envy that intoxicates your spirit. Come on, it's a perfect mixture of, of when doubt and envy start to work together. And then you come to a place, like Asaph said, as for me, I almost lost it, man. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. How does this happen? I'm going to tell you how it happens. It's when your, gaze, or your, when, when your glance turns to a gaze. Look, I'm going to say it like this. I can't control how people dress around me. I can only control how I look. I can't control what they put on billboards, but I can control how long I look at it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wow, let's just look longer. Right? I mean, I can't control what happens around me. I can only control how I respond to those things. Don't anybody be going back to this live recording and capturing that and, like, putting it out there? When your glance... Be turns to a gaze, you fixate on the wrong things, and you can't see what's right in front of you. And that's what was happening to Asaph. Now, 
Men, if you'll just give me a little liberty here, I'm going to take us on a little journey and throw us under the bus. But it's, it's kind of a fun one, so track with me, all right? When we were little boys, mom would, we would say we're hungry. Mom would say, hey, go to the refrigerator, such and such is in there, right? Let's say, anybody like ketchup in here? You guys love ketchup? Hey, do we have any ketchup, mom? Yeah, it's in the fridge. We go to the refrigerator, we open it up and what? I don't see it. I don't see it. It ain't here. Come on. Anybody ever, anybody, come, anybody ever do that? Yeah, I still do it. I still do it. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, I do it. I'm really bad with it. We've got some, like, I don't always like leftovers, but I do like some leftovers. And we can have some good leftovers that I've actually saved because I want to eat it. And then, like, I can, I'm so routine when I go to the refrigerator that it's like I look in certain places and I forget it's even there. I can look at it. I know it's in that container, but I'm so fixated on other things that I don't even see what's right in front of me. Nobody ever do that? Just me? I do it. I, I do it. Good. I got one amen back there with a hand raise. But what happens is I forget what's in there, and then food goes bad. How many of you know that milk is sweet? Right? There's, there's a reason why little kids like milk. It's not just because it's white and it's, it gives you healthy, strong bones. Right? It's sweet. It's got sugar in it. Right? But how many of you know what happens when milk spoils or it goes bad? What happens? It sours. Look what, look what Psalm 73, 21 and 22 says. Then I realized that my heart was bitter, and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal. Now, I want to ask you this question, a heartfelt question. When's the last time you ever prayed a prayer like that between you and the Lord? When's the last time you were ever this real with God, and you said, my heart's bitter. I'm the one that's bitter right now. Instead of, they made me. You did this. When was the last time we said, I was messed up on the inside, and you know what else, God? I was foolish, and I was ignorant. And you know what? In that moment, Lord, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. I told you, I wanted you to get real with it, right? When's the, we, we can pray stuff like this. Asaph was getting real with the Lord, and he realized that his heart had become contaminated, and he's like, I've become bitter. And the Hebrew word for, for bitter here is soured like the sour milk that I just mentioned. And I want you to see this. A sign that bitterness has crept in is that you no longer have a sweet spirit. A sign that bitterness has crept into your life is that you no longer have a sweet spirit. You're not like sweet milk. You've soured. And you know what? You become cynical. We become critical. Right? We become judgmental. We, we, we play the victim game. Everybody's out to get me because we lose our sweet spirit. We've been contaminated. We didn't get better. We got bitter. And Asaph realizes, I got bitter. I'm guilty. Can I tell you this, guys? Watch this. Somebody that wrote something we're reading in our Bible was willing to admit he was bitter, was willing to admit he almost lost his footing. How much more can we do? Come on, we can do this. We can get real so God can really do a deep work in our heart. And we be people of great faith. We can, be, we can find freedom. We can get healing. We don't have to walk around like this. We don't have to walk around like a senseless animal. He became, Asaph became a prisoner of his moment. He became a prisoner of his moment. And when that happens, all we can see is what might be happening in others. We, we think it's better in their life. We don't really know what it's like in their home. We just think that it might be better. Now, I'm going to invite the worship team to, to join me on the platform. I've got something that I, I normally don't do this, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm about to read you a short little story, okay? It's, it's a fable. It's not a real story, okay? But my eye contact is not going to be the best eye contact. So I'm telling you it's a longer story. I'm going to read it to you, but I need you to give me your full attention, and I know this story is going to encourage you, all right? So... They always tell you when you're, you're in your homiletics class, you're learning how to, to preach, and you're learning to do that. When you're reading long passages of Scripture, you've got to really work on your eye contact. Uh, if, you're, if you're ever giving speeches in your speech class, those things are all important. You don't want your audience to disengage, so I need you to put on your listening ears, all right, and focus in so nobody gets distracted. You probably thought I'm about to read for 30 minutes. It's not that long. But I wanted to set it up because I thought I could get you to listen a little better. Once there was an old man who lived in a tiny village. Although he was poor, he was envied by all, for he owned a beautiful white horse. Even the king coveted his treasure. A horse like this had never been seen before. Such was its splendor, its majesty, and strength. 
People offered fabulous prices for the steed, but the old man always refused. He said, the horse is my friend. He's not a possession. How could I sell a friend? One morning he found out the horse was not in the stable. All the village came to see him. You old fool, they scoffed. We told you that someone would steal your horse. We warned you. Your poor and had no way to protect such a valuable animal. You would have been better off if you'd have sold him. You could have gotten whatever price you wanted. Now the horse is gone and you've been cursed with misfortune. The old man responded, don't speak too quickly. Say only that the horse is not in the stable. That's all we know. The rest is judgment. If I've been cursed or not, how can you know? How can you judge? The people contested, don't make us out to be fools. We may not be philosophers, but great philosophy is not needed here. The simple fact that your horse is gone, that's a curse. The old man spoke again, all I know is that he's not in the stable. The rest I don't know. Whether it's a curse or a blessing, I can't say. All we can see is a fragment. Who can say what will come next? After 15 days, the horse actually returned. He hadn't been stolen. He'd just run away into the forest. Not only had he returned, he brought a dozen wild horses with him. And once again, the village people gathered around the old man and spoke, Old man, you were right. We were wrong. What we thought was a curse was a blessing. Please forgive us. The man responded once again, You've gone too far. Say only that the horse is back. Only state that a dozen horses returned with him. But don't judge. How do you know this is a blessing or not? You see only a fragment. Unless you know the whole story, how can you judge? You read only a page of the book. Can you judge the whole book? We read only one word of a phrase. Can you un understand the entire phrase? Life is so vast, yet you judge all of life with one page or one word. All you have is a fragment. Don't say that this is a blessing. No one knows. I'm content with what I know. I'm not perturbed by what I don't. Maybe the old man is right, they said to one another, but deep down they knew he was wrong. Deep down they knew he was wrong. This had to be a blessing. One horse brings back 12. Oh my goodness, the money that could be made. Because with a little hard work, the animals could be broken and trained and sold for so much money. And they just knew it. The old man had one son. The young man began to break the wild horses. After a few days, he fell from one of the horses and broke both legs. Once again, the villagers gathered around the old man and cast their judgments. You were right, they said. The dozen horses were not a blessing. They were a curse. Your only son has broken both legs, and now in your old age, you've got no one to help you. Now you're poorer than ever. The old man spoke again. You people are obsessed with judging. Don't go so far. Say only that he, my son broke his legs. Who knows if it's a blessing or a curse? No one knows. We own only a fragment. Life comes in fragments, you know. It so happened that a few weeks later, the country engaged in a war against a neighboring country. All the young men of the village were required to join the army. Only the son of the old man was excluded because he was injured. And guess what? Once again, they gathered around the old man crying and screaming because their sons had been taken. There was little chance that they would return and they would never see their sons again. You were right, old man, they wept. God knows you were right. This proves it. Your son's accident was a blessing. His legs may be broken, but at least he is with you. Our sons are gone forever. The old man spoke again. It is impossible to talk to you. You always draw conclusions. No one knows. Say only this. Your sons had to go to war and mine did not. No one knows if it's a blessing or a curse. No one is wise enough to know. Only God knows. The old man was right. We only have a fragment. Life's mishaps and honors are only a page out of a grand book. We must be slow about drawing conclusions. We must reserve judgment on life storms until we know the whole story. You know, I think this is what Asaph meant when he wrote verse 15. When he said, I had to keep my mouth shut, basically. You know what? Had I opened my mouth and said all these things, I really didn't know what was going to play out. And I think there's some things that we need to say less about and pray more about. And, and there are times, though, that we get so tempted and drawn into it that we can be just like the townspeople. And every time something happens, we've got something to say about it when we really don't know how things are going to play out. We really don't know exactly how everything is going to unfold. But how do I get out of this funk? That's something that I think all of us would love to know. If Asaph tells us that, you know, he almost lost his footing, he was almost gone, and you get envy, you get bitterness, you get jealousy in your heart, how, do you, how can you get free from all of this? And I think it might sound something like this, according to what Asaph writes, when I pulled into the parking lot of Purpose Church, and I walked into the sanctuary, 
Precious and the team begin to lead us into worship. And as I begin to worship the Lord, my perspective began to change. When I got into the presence, look at what the Word says. Then when I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. What was the shift? How did the perspective change? I got into the presence of God. I got into the presence of God. When I stopped fixating on everything around me, when I stopped fixating on the problems, and I just looked to God, God began to speak to me, and my perspective changed. See, sometimes there, it's, it's not that He gave me the answer, or He explained it all, because there were moments when Job, how many remember the story of Job in the Bible, not Job, but Job? How many of you know that there was just horrific and terrible things that happened to Job? And towards the end of it all, and his back and forth with God and all this, God begins to make some statements that I think can humble all of this. And he says, where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I told the waters of the sea where to stop? Where were you? And it was just a moment when he, he's like, I set the galaxies, and I created the sun, and I created the moon, and I formed you from dust. And I think it creates a moment that we're just like, Moses, when he says the secret things are left to God because we don't know it all. We don't understand it all. But perspective begins to change when I get into the presence of God. And, and when you get into a church that has a life-giving culture, when you get into this place, I think that that's when you begin to experience some of the things that we've been longing for. And just like Asaph, in verses 4 through 9 of this, it was all they this, they that. They did this, they did that, they're doing this, they get that. And then all of a sudden in verse 13, there's this shift and he stops pointing the finger and he starts pointing the finger here. I. Verse 18 through 22, it was then that you. He started looking here and then he started to see it there. And then it ends with you and I. See, if you'll stop focusing on things out there, start focusing on things in here and start focusing on things up there, you'll say this. Psalm 73, 23 and 24. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to your glorious destiny. My kids are a little older now, but when we used to cross the street, before we would do it, I'd take and grab one of them with one hand, grab the other one with the other hand. And as I would lead them across an area that might be unknown to them, that might be dangerous to them, the moment that I grabbed their hand, there was a sense of security. That they didn't have to know everything that was going on around them as long as I had them by the hand. And Asaph came to a place that as long as the Lord stretches out his hand, and as long as you're able to grab the Lord's hand, I don't have to have it all figured out. I just have the security of knowing that God is with me. You may not understand everything that's ever happened, but I do know this. If we can learn to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him that he will direct your paths. Something else I want to point out there in verse 24. It says, you guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. I'll close with this last little illustration. We don't quite do this as much as we used to do it, but we used to just take a special trip over to Chili's to get a molten lava cake with some extra scoops of ice cream. Sometimes we'd go in and we'd get a meal, and then after the meal was finished, you know what they do? They come and take all your plates, and they kind of clean it up ask you if you want any dessert, yes or no. But for us, it was always a molten lava cake. Well, after they cleared the table, you know what they would do? They would bring out and they would set extra spoons on the table. And you know what those extra spoons represented? Something good is coming. It's not here yet, but something good is coming. And can I just remind you that something good is coming? This isn't it. Romans chapter 8 says this. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory He will reveal to us later. In one sense, the Lord has given you a spoon, and He's telling you that something good is coming. You might not see it now. You might not understand it now, but something good is coming. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here this morning and you need to invite Jesus into your life and start that journey with Him, the Bible doesn't make it complicated. The Bible tells us that it's an opportunity for you to confess your sins and let God forgive you. It's a chance for you to put your faith in God and believe that He is. So Lord, I pray that you would give them faith to take that step in their faith journey this morning. Help them to call out on your name. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Lord, help them to call out on you. 
God, those in here this morning that have gone through some situations that have just left them just in a pain, place of deep discomfort and pain because they don't know why. Some bad things have happened. Some terrible things have happened. Some horrific things have happened. And God, it doesn't make sense to, us, sense to us. I pray this morning, Lord, you would reach out and take them by the hand. And although some bad and terrible things have happened, help them to know that you're with them. Something good is ahead. Help them to keep on keeping on. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Purpose Church YouTube channel. Before you go, would you hit the like and subscribe button to stay up on what's happening at Purpose Church? And make sure to share today's message with your friends and your family. If you'd like to support the ministries of Purpose Church, you can click the link in the comment section. And make sure to join us live on Sundays at 1030 a.m.